Herbert Richard Baumeister was the son of Dr. Herbert and Elizabeth Baumeister, both from the Butler Tarkington Courier and Ives region. Barbara Baumeister, a sister, was born in 1948. Richard Baumeister and Brad Baumeister were both born in 1954 and 1956. His father became an anesthesiologist, and his medical practice improved. The family eventually settled in Washington Township. Herbert's childhood was normal, but it was obvious that Herbert had a problem when he reached puberty. Bill Donovan, a close friend of Herb's, said that he often had strange thoughts about repulsive things. Like what it would feel like to smell human urine. He did some strange things. His irresponsible, often impulsive behavior soon caught the attention of his father, who sent him to psychiatric testing. The boy was eventually diagnosed with schizophrenia, and multiple personalities. But there is no evidence of any further treatment. Herb couldn't be considered one of the in kids because his high school was all about sports. He tried to be like them but just didn't fit in. He was a loner and spent a lot of time by himself. He was disoriented throughout his years of study. In his first year of college, he dropped out and returned to school for one semester each year. Despite this, he never graduated. His father was a respected person in the town. Eventually, the Indianapolis star hired Herb as an errand boy. Despite personal conflicts and unpredictable duties, Herb stood out because of his drive to succeed. He was soon promoted to the program director. Herb was a natural comedian, and took on the role with professionalism. Weinstein and Wilson both confirm that Herb displayed a bizarre sense of humor which was referred to by those who knew him. He urinated on the desk of his boss during his time at BMV. There was no hiding place for the culprit in the office. But Herb was still able to avoid being fired. Herb married, Julie, Sater in November 1971, at the United Methodist Church of Indianapolis. Julie graduated from university and was introduced by a mutual friend to Herb. The tall, blonde contractor with a boyish smile attracted her to him. Both were young Republicans who aspired to own their own businesses. Julie quit her position as a high school journalism teacher, during the second half 1970s to focus on raising a family. Herb also received a high salary at BMV. The couple had three children together. Marie was born in 1979, Eric in 1981, and Emily three years later. Son Eric was gambling in the backyard of his family when he found, half buried, an entire human skeleton. Julie anxiously awaited the arrival of her husband that day from the shop, after Eric showed the horrendous discovery to his mother. He explained to her in a monotone that the skeleton was one of his father's dissecting skulls. The body was kept in their storage, but after he decided to get rid of the storage, he buried it in the backyard. Virgil Vandergriff is a veteran of the law enforcement field. He has seen and heard enough drama during his time and as a Marion County Sheriff. So he's got a knack for spotting trouble. In 1982, he started a private investigation company, was honest and open to everyone. He continued to be involved in the commercial enterprise aspect of the business until he retired in 1989. Vandegrift did not alarm when the mother of two-year-old Alan Broussard approached her in June 1994 to tell him that her son was missing. So Virgil put up posters at Indianapolis, and another place with Alan's picture and asked anyone who saw him get in touch. Vandegriff initially believed there was no evil purpose behind Alan's disappearance. However, his perception of the maximum likely changed quickly. He was satisfied that Indianapolis had an insidious serial killer. Before the end of July? Three incidents occurred, each one tumbling at the pinnacle. Vandegrift first discovered that Mary Wilson, an Indianapolis police detective, was involved in the disappearances of several homosexual men at one point in the area. This is very similar to the Broussard mystery. Their bodily appearances were a bit similar. He also found a small article in Indiana Word about a man named Jeff Jones, who disappeared in 1992. Vandegrift's investigators found this homosexual way of living publication while searching the gay bars, for records about Broussard. It stated that Jones, 31, 
had vanished into thin air from Indianapolis. Van de Grift discovered that Jones had a similar history of social indifference to the other prodigals. Van de Grif was happy to consider those disappearances more than just circumstantial. He considered them the cause of any other disappearance. Roger Allen Goodlett, a 34-year-old man, moved out of his mom's house in July, to join a gay bar on 16th Street. Roger was almost as oblivious to the other guys. He was roughly the same age and had the same informal lifestyle. Goodlett's mom was able to get to Vandergriff because she didn't need to go to compulsory prison. She sat as she told Virgil about Roger, his adolescent disposition, his trusting nature and his tendency to drink too much. There were some reasons why Roger was inclined to let me venture the streets. Vandergriff said that being attentive to her recite felt like a repetition of the classes she took with Alan Broussard. It would be foolish to ignore the fate of those three guys. A search by Vandergriff and Bill Hillsley, his investigator, did not turn up anything useful in the gay bars in the town. The owners and the customers of these institutions seemed too nervous to speak. However, Goodlett left our place with another man, in a mildly blue car with an Ohio license plate. Vandergriff found the police disinterested, based on the records he provided. The private detective was no longer discouraged. He knew he had reached the crucial point, and had enough experience to make a wise judgment in such a case. Sometimes breakthroughs can come from the most unexpected places and in the most surprising ways, and he was right. One certainly provided itself in August, just a few weeks after he started the case. Tony Harris, a fellow from the gay bar scene, had seen Roger Goodlett. He saw Vandergriff's posters and believed that he had found some records that would solve the mystery of Roger's location. Although his story was unbelievable, he claimed it was true. He had been in a relationship with a man who he believed to be a serial killer. He tried to tell the local police, but they treated him like he was crazy. The FBI stated that he had been on a drug trip. Roger's mother called and put him in touch with Vandergriff. Tony Harris had spoken to the killer and seen him. He may have miraculously escaped with his own life, but this is what he seemed to do in retrospect. Over the next few weeks, Tony visited Vandergriff's office several times, each one yielding more information. Tony was anything other than farm on the sign. The Buick stopped in front of a large Tudor country home, which was unlit. While refusing the offer, Brian noticed that his host had become darker. Brian was insistent that they have a party, but he first excused himself. 
he continued, indicating that he wanted to pinch the veins in his neck. It's a wonderful buzz. It's amazing to see the reaction of someone when you do it to them. You can see the results when their lips change color. As if this was Brian's real name, continue to tell Tony about his asphyxiating delights. But now, Tony is convinced Brian murdered Roger, and God only knows who else. Tony placed his hands on Brian's neck and lay down. Brian leaned over his playmate and tied the choker around his throat. His face was flushed with anticipation. Tony was unable to wait for more results as the garroting intensified and his blood pressure increased. Tony feigned unconsciousness. He closed his eyes and felt Brian relax. Brian whispered his name. He took another pause before shaking his head violently. Brian began to rage when Tony opened his eyes. You scared me to death. This is how you die. There have been many accidents. Tony was open about it and said, is that what Roger Goodluck did? Did he happen to be one of your mishaps? Did you have any other accidents? Tony had hoped to make a confession but was disappointed. Brian stared at him in confusion, unable to comprehend, and lost in the haze of any substance he had consumed. His response was a fool's smile. Brian behaved as though the whole thing were an amusing, harmless game that was completely under his control. Brian began to slur his speech and was soon overcome by sleep. Tony was able to visit the upper floors of the house. He didn't believe Brian's story that he was merely a landscaper. And that the estate's owner had not yet moved into the house. He was not wrong. In the dark house above, he found children's toys and women's clothes in every room. The place had clearly been lived in for a while. He wished he knew the real name of Brian Smart. He thought this one was a phony, and figured that the police would love to know his real identity. He began to search through Brian's worn-out trousers for a wallet, and he returned downstairs. Tony dropped his trousers when the other started to snort and shake as if he was awake. Brian awoke before he could have another chance to spy. Tony convinced Brian to drive Tony back to the town. After getting dressed and searching for his keys, he led Tony back towards the Buick. He then turned toward Indianapolis. Brian praised his partner's positive behavior. Tony made a promise to Tony that he would meet him at the 501 Club on Wednesday, as the car rolled into the town. Tony was not certain where Brian's house actually was located. However, it appeared to be either Westfield or Carmel, two very exclusive Hamilton County suburbs. Vandergriff, based on the instructions, knew that Vandergriff was referring to the location outside Marion County, where Indianapolis is located. Tony's vague description of the house could have been adapted to fit any of the 100 estates that were in the area. He had no other information except that a sign near the driveway said something about farms. Vandegrift became anxious as the Wednesday approaching for Tony and Brian's rendezvous approached. While Tony sat inside, Steve Rivers, one of his men, posted outside. Rivers was named after Tony, who had seen several cars in the garage of the Deviant. Watchful eyes scanned the faces of everyone in an automobile as it passed. No one fit Brian's description, brown-haired, long-faced, pale. It was clear that Tony Harris had been re-elected by Vandergriff just as the bar was closing that night. Vandergriff realized that he had discovered a larger case than the one of a missing person, and contacted the Indianapolis Police Department. Virgil took Tony Harris' information and sent him and his incredulous story to the police. Vandergriff was aware that Mary Wilson, a no-nonsense detective, was already involved in many other cases involving missing persons. She was always available to him. Mary Wilson, a pretty, dark-haired woman in her mid-forties had steadily climbed the ranks of the Indianapolis Police Department from beat cop to detective. She was a member of the sex crime division and quickly learned about the pathology of sexual criminals as well as the aberrations that go along with them. She realized that people are not always what they appear on the surface when she transferred to missing persons. Fanny Weinstein, Melinda Wilson, and Mary Lovell liked nearly everything about missing person cases. Finding people gave me a sense of closure. 
tracing the steps of someone. Follow every lead until it reaches its logical conclusion. As if you were unraveling all the threads of a piece of cloth. She considered it the best kind of police work. She was actually the principal investigator in the Jeff Jones case, which Vandergriff had seen in the Indiana Word. The details of this case were so similar to those in the missing person reports for Roger Goodlett or Alan Broussard. Mary was also investigating disappearances of Indianapolis men. These included Richard Hamilton, 20 years old, Johnny Bayer, 21 years old, Alan Livingston, 28 years old, and other disappearances that date back to the early 1990s. Mary recognized Tony Harris, possibly the connection that could help to link these disappearances. He actually had a night with the killer and was open to sharing his story in all its twisted and bizarre details. Mary heard his story and he accompanied her to the suburbs to search for the nightmare scene. He pulled into each gate, but none of the private houses struck a common chord. Mary designated plainclothesmen as the guardians of the gay bars in town, the 501 Club, Varsity, and Our Place. They spoke to bar owners and frequenters to find out if they could identify the elusive throttler or kidnapper. Tony told her to get me this guy's license plate number and they'll take it from here. Fanny, Melinda and Mary said that Tony was not sure he could come up with the number. He and his friends had a better chance than Mary. Brian could have shown up at the bars again. Tony continued to drop by Vandergriff's to talk to Connie Pierce randomly, whom he felt a connection with. It was Connie's open-minded, compassionate nature, as well as her boss's perception of crime fighting that all pursuits were fair. Connie had the idea of calling Wanda, a psychic from Ohio, to help her. In the hope that Wanda would shed some light on the location of the house with the mannequins, she shared the facts from Vandergriff's tape recordings. Connie was shocked by Wanda's words, even though she couldn't pinpoint the exact location. So Bill Hillsley, a former state trooper who knew the roads and byways in the Indianapolis area, was dispatched to help him search the country suburbs. He found a sign that said Fox Hollow Farms at the end of Westfield's long driveway. Tony Harris had said that he saw a sign at Brian's house that stated farms something and he thought he'd investigate. Hillsley found a large estate that resembled Tony's description. It was run down, dark, and crowded. He parked his Azuzu and looked through many windows in the hope of seeing an indoor pool or smelling the chlorine smell. He knew he was violating the law, so he didn't stop, but he felt certain that this could be the place Tony had been to. He discovered that it belonged to Baumeister's family. Vandergriff ordered aerial photos of the property. Tony was not impressed by the photos and he reacted to them with a slow, but firm, reply. No, Tony, I don't think so. The driveway seems too short from what it used to be. Her Baumeister maintained his facade. His marriage to Julie continued as normal. Their two save -a shops continued to take up much of their day. The cracks that were invisible to the rest of the world up until then began to show. Julie's mannerisms and expressions revealed the strains of a loveless, sexless marriage. Everyone was talking, both at home and around the block. Their business started to suffer professionally. The Savalots was in serious trouble by 1994. Shoppers declined to ply with his demands. His workaday behavior was laughable. He would disappear for hours and then return, reeking with alcohol and barking orders through his whiskey breath. Baumeister's neglect had made the once tidy stores look sloppy. One Herbs Clark recalls that everything was so filthy, and there were mountains upon mountains of garbage bags everywhere. It was like working in the garbage. Virgil Vandergriff, Mary Wilson and Mary Wilson had been searching for a man called Brian Smart for almost a year. It was still unknown who he really was and what his house contained. Wilson and Vandergriff took the challenging path, that was necessary to make their point. Herb Baumeister stopped by the Varsity Lounge in August 1995, as he believed the situation was stable enough to allow him to make a comeback on the gay scene. Tony Harris was present at the bar, who, having lost all hope of seeing Brian Smart again, resisted jumping out of his shoes in excitement. He talked with Baumeister casually, and then, at the end of the evening, 
he was able to record Baumeister's pickup truck license plate. Mary was cheered when she heard about Tony's accomplishments the next morning. He lived with his wife and their children in Fox Hollow Farms. Mary and, her boss, approached Baumeister at Washington Street's store on November 1st, after having surveyed Baumeister's actions for a term. Mary spoke to Baumeister straight, without pretense. They were investigating the disappearances of young men from the Indianapolis community. He refused to speak with them, saying that he was a saint who suffers from this kind of thing. Green later told Mary in the car that he believed Herb was nervous beyond belief and one of my strangest guys. Mary was not content with Herb's refusal and tried to outsmart him. Julie Baumeister was the one she approached. As co-owner of Fox Hollow, she could legally authorize a ground search of the known property. However, the detective found Julie to be just as stubborn and stubborn as Herb. Evidently, Herb had informed Julie that he was falsely accused of theft. If approached, she advised her to do not allow the police to search your home. Mary then gave Julie her card and encouraged her to call her if she had any questions. The law knew that Julie's refusal to speak for herself did not prove her guilt. That was typical of a wife who refused to marry someone with such dark sides. It was so bad that Julie called Mary Wilson to complain about her domestic problems. Vandegriff deplores the waiting game played by the county police. Mary wanted a search warrant but Hamilton County was not within her jurisdiction. Hamilton County refused to cooperate in the interim. Why? We don't know. Whether it was their timidity to confront an otherwise law-abiding citizen until they had conclusive proof, or whether they really didn't believe Baumeister was guilty, I don't know, but it might have saved a lot of trouble and the six-month wait it eventually took for Julie to finally open her backyard for inspection. Julie's awakening came six months later, in June 1996. Her husband had become paranoid and erratic over the years. When the Children's Bureau cancelled its contract with two failing save -a -lot shops in May, it seemed like he was going to the end of his rope. The woman's home life was becoming unbearable. Herb and she had started separate divorce proceedings. Her mind kept replaying the doubts Mary forced into her head about Herb's sanity. She realized suddenly that she had no loyalty to her husband. She called Bill Wendling her lawyer on June 23 and asked him to contact Mary Wilson. Herb was currently visiting Lake Wawazi with her son Eric. She wanted to use this opportunity to tell Mary all about the bones that she found in her backyard. The following day after Julie's lawyer notified her, Mary Wilson drove anxiously to Fox Hollow Farms. Accompanying her were two very skeptical Hamilton County officials, Captain Tom Anderson of the County Sheriff's Office, and a detective, Jeff Markham. In truth, Anderson was sure that the human remains Wilson hoped to find would turn out to be animal bones. Julie Baumeister, with attorney Wendling at her side, met the law enforcement people at her front door that afternoon and led them through the house to the wooded backyard. There, she pointed to the spot where, two years earlier, her son Eric had found a skeleton. The reason she had not notified the authorities until now, she claimed, was because she had believed Herb's story about the bones being no more than a dissecting skeleton, his recent erratic actions. The yard appeared normal at first glance. But, as the men began to kick through the low grass and patches of dirt just beyond the back patio, they encountered a bone about a foot long. The bone was charred from having been burned. They weren't sure if it was human. Then, as their eyes focused on the area immediately around them, it quickly became apparent that those many pebbles and rocks strewn across the flat cover were not pebbles and rocks, but fragments of bone. Watching the police scoop up one chipped and broken bone after another, now looked down at his own feet. It struck him with a chill that he too was standing on bone chips where the Baumeister kids played their innocent childhood games. At one point, he leaned over to pick up what were obviously human teeth. Pieces of bone lay everywhere. Still, the county people on site were unconvinced that what they were gathering and taking photographs of were human. On this point, they were at odds with Mary Wilson. Unlike her law enforcement counterparts from Hamilton County, Mary, had heard the fear in Tony Harris' voice. 
She'd seen firsthand how nervous Herb had been and how he had done everything in his power to keep her off his land, including lying to Julie about their investigation. Now she knew why. She delivered the bags of evidence to forensic anthropologist for examination. In a flash, he replied, they're human. They're recent. And they've been burned. Police returned to the scene the next day, looking for evidence of one of the most horrific crimes Indiana had ever seen. It became apparent that Herbert Baumeister's backyard graveyard could contain the remains of many young gay men who had disappeared from Indianapolis over the years. To conduct a thorough dig, other officials joined the original search team. Sonia Leerkamp, a prosecuting lawyer, was among the group. A half-dozen detectives were also part of the group. The hunt began by placing small orange flags in the ground where a bone fragment was found. They dropped close to a hundred of these markers in a matter of minutes. Naraki summarized the situation by saying, it looks almost like a massive disaster scene. Other police officers inspected the interior of Baumeister's home as the digging continued well into the night. The mannequins and the wet bar were all found, as Tony Harris had described them. They discovered something Tony hadn't seen at the time of his encounter with Baumeister. It was a semi-hidden camera that had been used to record the strangulations. Each hour, the case became more bizarre. Julie became anxious about Eric, her son, as he was at Lake Wawazi with Herb. She felt the reality creeping in and feared for Herb's safety if he discovered what was going on at home. The boy was removed from the father's sight by Leerkamp, a prosecutor, and a county judge. Baumeister tried to keep his son safe but to no avail. Baumeister had no reason to suspect his secret was being revealed back at Fox Hollow and he believed that this custody action was a ploy to stop his divorce proceedings. Herb was calm and unaffected when the police arrived with the necessary papers to escort him home. A lot was happening back at the estate. The Baumeister puzzle pieces were being put together by county interrogators. The bones found in the compost piles were strong, indicating that the killer had placed his body under garbage and leaves. Tony, Herb's obsessive about strangling and sexual asphyxiation was what they interviewed. They had one big question, how could Herb have strangled, burned and buried these men with no family knowledge? Julie said that widow Baumeister would sometimes visit her and the children for several months, especially during summers, leaving Herb at home. The incidences were matched by balancing the disappearances of victims, with periods when she and her family were away. The excavations in the backyard continued without interruption. There were now 60 diggers, most of them volunteers who were mostly ex-firemen and policemen. In the first few days of their search, 5,500 bones, teeth, and bone fragments were found. According to Naraki's calculations, this made up four bodies. The search for the Baumeister property was not over after the team had searched the entire 18 acres. A neighbor from a nearby farm came into the police station to tell them they found more evidence of bones. They led investigators to a drainage ditch, which separated the two properties. There were so many human spines, vertebrae, and ribs that one official murmured, Jesus Christ. They're everywhere? They were more visible than the bones found on Baumeister land, and they were much more numerous. Shovels brought back more bones, and cans of Miller Genuine Draft Beer, Herb's favorite drink, as well as handcuffs that probably tied the bodies in death. The mortal count was now at 11 men when exhumation had ended. They were only able to identify four of them. Roger Allen Goodlett, 34, Stephen Hale 26 Richard Hamilton 20, Manuel Resendez 31. The fugitive then entered Canada, and spent several days there before driving east to Grand Bend, Ontario. On the evening of July 3rd, Herb would take his own life at Pinery Park. He held a .357 Magnum revolver to his forehead, and pulled the trigger. He left a note attributing his decision to a failing business, and an irreparable marriage. He didn't mention the skeletons left behind in Westfield. Instead, he wrote on the three-page suicide note that he would now eat a peanut butter sandwich, his favorite snack, and then go to sleep. 
Van de Grift drew connections between Indianapolis disappearances of gay men and the strangling murders of homosexuals found along Interstate 17 in Ohio. Both Tony Harris and David Lindloff, a prosecutor from Preble County, Ohio, who was in charge of the investigation of what was called the I-70 murders, recognized tight similarities in their testimony. The last known I-70 murder occurred in 1990, not long before the disappearances in Indianapolis began. Lindloff remembered his conversations with Vandergriff as the news spread of bodies found in Fox Hollow Farms. Lindloff now had a suspect and found her Baumeister had made countless business trips to Ohio in the 1980s. Since Julie had already accepted that her husband was the maniac who strangled men while she and the children were away, this new claim did not surprise her. Herb drove their car on those trips, and she provided Lindloff with the receipts, phone records, and other information he requested. Witnesses had claimed they saw a man strangling someone on I-70, and provided police with a sketch of Baumeister. In fact, eyewitnesses identified Herb's picture as the same man who drove Michael Riley home from a bar the night he was found dead. Soon after, officials from combined Ohio and Indiana counties held a press conference linking Baumeister to the I-70 killings. Skeptics existed, Vandergriff admits. There is no telling if he was the same man or not. Everything points to him, even that he bought his house shortly after ending his roadside killings and now had space to dump their bodies with less trouble. We have more to think about with Vandergriff. As a private investigator, I do not always have the financial or the liberty to follow my suspicions to their logical conclusion. Otherwise, I would have taken the Herbert Baumeister case a lot further than I feel the police did. While Mary Wilson did an excellent job, I think some loose ends needed to be tied up. Specifically, he mentions one loose end neither in the home video examining the case after the fact. Herb had an older brother who lived in Texas. Now, I don't know whether Herb had visited him at the time, but, he was found dead in a whirlpool along with Herb. This happened around the same time Herb was strangling people in his pool. Does that sound familiar at all? There is no doubt, Herbert Baumeister fit the serial killer niche. In fact, Vandergriff says he was right there. In a report titled Who is a Serial Killer? Vandergriff shares his insights into their mind. Adapting excerpts from this informative work to Baumeister's persona. His intelligence ranges from below average to above average. He does not know his victims nor has any particular hatred for them. He is typically white, male, between the ages of 25 and 35. He is often married, has children and works full-time. The lust killer takes their cues from the killings. They are usually aroused by the heinous act. The more heinous the act, the more aroused they become. Baumeister fits into the last category of killers, the psychotic, the missionary, the thrill, and the thrill killer. Baumeister suffered traumas in life including poor body image, phobias and over-concerned about what co-workers thought of him at the Indianapolis Star and at the DMV. Herb also suffered from this phenomenon called, disassociation, which involves, separation of feelings, as he could kill and then continue living with his children. Acts of fantasy, controlling others and compulsive masturbation, and acts of violence fantasy, exposure and fantasy of murder, follow disassociation. The demise of the save -a stores reinforced Herb's trauma, he lost his job and experienced financial stress. The use of alcohol and drugs by Herb Harris as facilitators seems to have contributed to his crimes. Harris witnessed the serial killer use both during the evening he spent with him at Fox Hollow. Some people say that these facilitate the crimes. Others say they give that criminal an excuse, in other words, something to blame. Killers start with a specific time between killings that varies from killer to killer. But as they become more successful, the intervals between killings grows shorter. Meanwhile, as the killer gets high, the need to get high grows stronger. Hence, the murders become more frequent. Many serial killers are perfectionists. Baumeister was one. They don't leave evidence. Many times. Many times the method of killing is associated with their fantasy, and they often keep a souvenir from the victim. In Herb's case, 
the videotapes fulfilled that need. Herb got caught following the mode of all serial killers' downfalls. He was overconfident in his ability to fend off any investigation. Being overconfident, he left clues in his wake. One common trait Herb practiced was leaving his victims' remains in close proximity to his home. Heber Richard Baumeister was the consummate serial killer.